Good deal. We are now joined by Ryan Newman, driver of the number six Ford Mustang for Roush Fenway Racing. We're going to go. We're going to go straight into questions uh, for for Ryan. So if you have a question, raise your hand, and we will get a we will call upon you. We're going to start with Alex Andreev. Alex, go ahead with your question. Hey Ryan. Yeah, I, um, I understand you've been doing some consulting to NASCAR for safety recommendations, sort of since your accident last year, and have continued to do that. And I'm wondering what what specifically those recommendations have been. Um, I haven't really considered myself a consultant. I don't really feel I'm any different than any other driver out there when it comes to talking about safety or, you know, the benefits of the safety that we've created over the last, say, 30, 40 years. So, um, yeah, yes, I have had conversations with them and, and talking about um, the barriers, talking about the cars, talking about foams and things like that. But reality is it's no different now than it was in the last 20 years of my career, in my opinion. When I say that, no different, I mean no different as far as the communication, the level of communication that I have in, in my consulting. And then, um, you know, we're coming up on the 20th anniversary of Dale Earnhardt's death. You were racing some cup events um, for Roger Penske at the time. What, what do you remember about that accident? And is that, has that kind of influenced how much you've been involved with NASCAR or how seriously you've taken safety, you know, post that crash? Yeah, I had, I had one competitive cup start against Dale Senior and wished I would have had a whole lot more um, just because he was an idol of mine. Um, I, I really look forward to the opportunity to get to race with him more, and that obviously was cut short. So, yeah, but that, that anniversary is special more now than ever because of my anniversary being one year um, this, this coming February, obviously, of the 500 of, of my big crash that um, I was able to walk away from. And the reality is, is the, the start of my crash was really no different than the start of his crash, which was basically the end of his crash. And, and I, um, and I can see the, the uh, progression that we've had from a safety standpoint. And, um, you know, that's, uh, that's going to be a topic of many and hopefully not the, uh, not the end topic, um, when the checkered flag falls on February, I think 14th, right. Of, uh, the 500 and, and, um, the real story will be the, the racing and not the, the last big crashes that we've had. Our next question is going to come from Bob Pockers. Go ahead with the question, Bob. Yeah, Ryan, um, ever since Earnhardt's crash, NASCAR has gone to outside sources, outside engineers to help with safety. And certainly they felt some resistance from inside the garage. I'm curious with your educational background and everything, how do you marry engineering and seat of the pants rating knowledge? Uh, I think they've always been married um, as long as there's been engineering involved. And I think engineering is a new term for something that's been around for a long time. Um, when I say new term, I mean engineering is kind of more based off of people with computers than, than it was in Einstein's days, right? But the reality is, is engineers have been around for a long time. We've just termed them differently. And, and I think that um, there is there is truly a balance of, um, let me say it this way, there's a balance of um, seat of the pants, feelings, and knowledge of what you're experiencing as a driver versus somebody that simulates or uses a computer program or tries to assess uh, data um, and gets access to data um, to try to understand something. It's um. It's like a crash test dummy, right? Like you, you would, you would always want to be the dummy if you wanted to learn more. You just can't prove that the dummy is going to live through every accident. So, um, you know, we, we um, I think NASCAR has done a, a really good job of of taking everything, everything involved in the safety of our sport, not just the drivers, not just the fans, not just the race cars, but everything involved that res is respectful to safety. Um, but we got to keep doing more and, and they know that and we'll continue to do that. Thank you. Our next question will come from Jacob Seelman. Go ahead with the question. Thank you, Matt and Ryan. Uh, thank you for taking the time with us this morning. Uh, two questions for you. First, uh, you and I talked at, at Chili Bowl and you said that, you know, when you got back behind the wheel, regardless of what car it was, the, the motivation 
wasn't any different, but given, you know, the one year anniversary, some of the, you know, all the talk that went around your crash, is there a sense maybe of, you know, coming back here to Daytona with it being the 500 and this kind of, you know, finishing what you came so close to last year? Well, that was the hope even back in uh, whatever it was, September or whenever it was when we, when we raced there um, was to be able to have that dramatic chapter uh, come to an end with a victory in a playoff berth. But, um, you know, it's, it's, um, it would be even more special to, uh, to come back a year later and to, and, and really just in, in all reality, just to have an opportunity to do or come as close as we would, as we did last year, um, would be amazing as well. So, um, you know, I've, <laughs> I've been around the sport long enough to know that there's drivers that have never got a top 10, let alone a top five, or in my case, a top 10 on the roof. Um, let alone have a shot at the Daytona 500 the way I did last year. So just being in the hunt again would, you know, will be an amazing feeling, hopefully. Um, and, and all the things that go along with it, you know, Kohler generators, it'll be their, their first race on a cup car, uh, an amazing story if we can put all those things together. And in talking about safety, obviously you've tried to help NASCAR understand and, and make things better in light of your crash. I know there, there are some drivers that, might not want to watch a moment like that back. Have you did when you watch it back? If you have, did you do so trying to understand what happened in terms of hoping to improve the safety? Well, one hundred percent. I mean, I've watched every angle that I could possibly watch. The biggest problem is is I don't have any memory of my own angle, uh, which is right the ultimate the ultimate angle, um, and that's gone, and that'll always be gone, and, and no matter how many times I watch a replay or a different variation of that replay, it doesn't change my personal memory because it just doesn't exist. And, and um, you know, I, I will continue to study and watch whether it's my crash or somebody else's crashes. Um, you know, I've, I've lost some, some good friends. Um, you know, go back to uh, Kenny Irwin and his, his crash at uh, New Hampshire years and years ago. Um, the, the, there's been improvements made to that wall and, 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 and good reason for it. Um, unfortunately, Kenny's no longer here and, and we will always continue to learn from those that we lose and those that we don't lose as long as we keep uh, focused on the things that we need to, to increase uh, our level of safety. Thank you for your candor, Ryan. Good luck next week. Yep. Our next question will come from Michelle Martinelli. Go ahead with the question, Michelle. Hi, Ryan. Um, sort of actually building off that last question about motivation and getting back into the car, um, whether it was last year and going back to Daytona or at Talladega or, you know, this year returning to the Daytona 500, um, did you ever have any hesitation or any doubts about getting back behind the wheel at those racetracks? And if not, how do you get to that point mentally? No, I've, I have had zero. Um, I've had people question me of if I've questioned it myself, no different than, than you. Um, but the reality is, um, and I had this conversation just a little while ago doing an interview was God works in mysterious ways. And one of those mysterious ways that I can't answer is the, the deletion of that chapter of that, that, that part of my hard drive that was that day so that I can't remember the, the potential tragedy that that wasn't right. So I don't have any fear because I don't have any memory. And that was the same analogy I, I used with him was if, um, if you've ever been in a car accident or you know somebody that's been in a car accident and they were conscious the whole time, they will always carry that fear with them. And I have no memory, so therefore I have no fear. But it's also my passion and my love and what I, what I enjoy doing, right? It's a paid hobby. It's the most amazing job you could ever have. Um, and, and, and that's where my focus is, is I, I just am doing my best to continue and try to to uh, become a cup champion. That's, that's uh, the way I feel is I still have another opportunity and God's given me that opportunity and I'll enjoy it with my two beautiful girls and, and uh, our team together. Thank you. Yep. Our next question will come from Jeff Megalioshetti. Go ahead with the question, Jeff. Hi, Ryan. Good morning. Thank you for joining us today. It seems Thank like you. yesterday you were beating out Jimmy Johnson for the rookie of the year title and so much. Has but you're old too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I, I, I trust me. How do you think I feel? But, um, <laughs> but um, no, but so much has changed in NASCAR since then. We've seen so many changes in the sponsors, and now we're going to see a new car added to the mix come this time next year. How proud are you of the changes that NASCAR has made in the two decades since you began full time racing? And where do you, th- and how hopeful are you for the future of this sport? I'm hopeful. No doubt. I think a lot of people are, I mean, we, we live our, our everyday lives, at least a huge percentage of us uh, do in transportation, right? We go to or from work, we go to the grocery store, we go visit our friends, we go see some kind of form of entertainment. We, we we're connected to vehicles. um, And a lot of us are connected to performance vehicles. And that's why a lot of us love racing more so than, than stick and ball sports. Um, So yeah, I'm, 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 I feel like I'm blessed. I'm one of those guys. I'm a motorhead. I got grease under my fingernails and, and uh, enjoy it. Going back to your original statement, I'll say this, and I've, I've told Jimmy to his face, um, you know, you can win a championship every year, but you can only win a rookie of the year once. And I got that over him. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, just to follow up real quick, how was Rescue Ranch able to make a difference, your charity Rescue Ranch, able to make a difference in such an unusual year? And uh, thank you for your time. Yeah, we've had to be a little bit more creative and open up some other opportunities for some revenue and, and raise some awareness in different ways. So uh, we just opened up a foster program, um, which is really using our community as a foster resource to um, to hold and, and, and maintain the lives of animals before they can become adopted. Um, and we use that. We, they, they use us and we use them as it should be um, in, in our community to uh, to keep those animals alive. I mean, our main goal is to educate kids about animals. Um, but that means we need to keep these animals alive. That means we need to eliminate the overpopulation of pets and and we do everything we can through spaying and neutering and pet adoption and things like that. So it's become a challenge because of the social distancing and the, you know, the way everything works with um, group gathering and programs and camps and stuff that we have for our kids. So um, go to rescueranch.com and check it out. We I literally just filmed a, a little video for them this morning talking about it. And um, it's, it's, um, it's still near and dear to my heart. And it's become a bigger challenge because of the way our society is reacting to this situation. But um, that won't be the only hurl, hurdle we have in the next decade. Thank you, Ryan. Good luck this weekend. Thank Good you. Thank our, you. Next qu- our next question is going to come from Lee Spencer. Go ahead with your question, Lee. Lee, you're on mute. Okay, we're going to move on to our next question. We'll go to uh, Deb Williams. Go ahead with the question, Deb. Thank you. Morning, Ryan. How are you doing? Good, Miss Deb. How are you? Fine, thank you. Um, As Daytona approaches, have your daughters wanted to talk to you more about returning to the Daytona 500, or have you all had any conversations to kind of set them at ease and make them feel more comfortable with going back to the Daytona 500? You know, it was, um, I'm glad you asked, because it was was fun for me to get to the Chili Bowl because it was the first racing event that they got to go to to watch me race again, albeit a short night and uh, not the success that I wanted to have, but it was, it was, um, it was humbling and, and heartwarming for me to have them there and be, get back in the race car. And I look forward to that again, um, to get back into a cup race or get them into a cup race and, and have them be a part of it. So it's, it's had its challenges, no doubt, because of everything that's going on, but um, it will be special to have that one year anniversary and hopefully a chance, another great chance to get them to victory lane as we were so close last year. That's true. Uh, they've not been edgy or nervous or no, they, they, they're looking forward to it. They're like, oh, they OK, I mean, absolutely. There's no there's no. Um, well, this is what daddy put, the, put. This is what put daddy in the hospital feelings. It's mm-hmm. no, we want to go see you race. And that that means a lot to me. And I guess in the grand scheme of things, that makes it easier for maybe you guys to understand the perspective of, you know, why would he not retire or why does he mm-hmm. want to keep doing this? And again, I have no reason to to do to not do what I love. Great. Thank you. Have a good season. Thank you. Our next question is going to come from Holly Kane. Go ahead with the question, Holly. Thank you. Hey, Ryan. Hey, Holly. How are you? I am good. I I want to ask you kind of a deeper question. Would would you say after your accident, you've maybe become more philosophic, more big picture, generally speaking, at, at the way you look at things? Sometimes when people go through, you know, a traumatic experience like that, they look at things a little differently on the other side. Yeah, and I it's a, it's a little bit of a jaded answer because the reality is, yes, people have asked me, have you changed? And I, I continually say, no, I haven't changed. But what, what happens, and you said it, um, but you added some more words in there, is 
is it's a magnifier, right? The things that you love, you love more uh, because you were potentially taken or a part of you was taken away for even a little bit of time even. Um, so yeah, it's, it's opened my eyes and made me more appreciative of a lot of things in life and probably a little bit more positive and I guess jolly, you could say, um, in, in respect to some of the other things that don't go so well. So I, I, um, I feel like it has, it has magnified my personality for all the positive things and therefore decreased some of the negative things. And I don't think that that's considered a change to me. That's really just, um, an adjustment. A fine tuning, so to speak. It, which everybody needs at times. And we all say it like, well, you know, he deserved that, or, you know, he, that, that he had that coming for him. Like, you know, he, th those are the things that we use to educate ourselves. And, and again, God works in mysterious ways. And I'm, I'm, um, I'm happy to be here sitting here talking to you. And um, it makes me appreciate things as well. Well, we're happy you're here talking to us too. Thanks so much, Ryan. Thank you. And we're going to try once again, Lee Spencer. Lee, go ahead with the question. Thank you, Matt. And thank you for joining us, Ryan. You mentioned that you would have liked to have raced with Dale Earnhardt more, but is his bigger legacy just the advancements that have been made in safety since his passing? I don't think it's his bigger legacy, but it is a big part of his legacy. Um, and there was nobody, in my opinion, that's going to remember Dale Earnhardt for the way that he died. People remember Dale Earnhardt for the way that he raced and the way that he lived. Uh, which go hand in hand because uh, I didn't know Dale Earnhardt as a farmer. I mean, there's YouTube videos out there and there's stories about it. I didn't know Dale Earnhardt as a hunter. Again, there's stories out there, but I knew him as a racer. I knew him as the guy that drove the black three car. And if he didn't win it outright, he knocked somebody out of the way to get it done and stood in victory lane and smiled about it. And, and a lot of people love that. A lot of people hated that. And that's, that's the legacy that I will always remember him by. Uh, unfortunately, because of the way the, the book ended for him, um, there's a different version of that legacy and it, and it has a different opinion, I guess you can create a different opinion of it. And, um, you know, again, I feel fortunate that my book, or at least that chapter didn't end that way for me. And, and, um, you know, we did learn a lot from what happened to him, what happened in that situation. Um, you know, a, a bad racing accident, no doubt. Um, we learned a lot and we collectively have kept so many drivers alive since then because of the adjustments that have been made in the safety of our sport. I mean, I, I'm, I asked from the perspective that you did know Kenny Irwin, you did race against Kenny Irwin, yeah. but it really seemed that the push to do something surrounding around safety went into overdrive after the passing of the seven time champion. No doubt, no doubt. And I think that that was, you know, that was, let me say it this way, it was, it was necessary to take something that should have been proactive and that was, that was being reacted to. It should have, it took something that should have been proactively worked on and we learned and it was like, okay, that's it. That's the last straw. We need to do something here. And, and it's no doubt, no doubt in my mind that it's because of a lot of it is because of who it was, but that's the way life works. Appreciate your time today. Our next, luck this year. Thank you. Our next question is going to come from Zach Albert. Go ahead with your question, Zach. Uh, thanks, Matt. Uh, Ryan, uh, Blaney was on yesterday and, and talked about uh, his part in uh, the accident that happened last year. And What, what um, did you remember? <laughs> well, it, he, he talked about saying just how everything happened so fast, how everything, you know, kind of went in a split second um, and that it was a tough night for him just to, you know, knowing what had happened and not knowing all the details. Um, he said he talked to you, you know, a few days afterwards. Um, and uh, I, I won't ask what the personal nature of the conversation was like, but were you able to kind of reassure him and, and talk to him about, about his role in that and just what the racing situation was like? Yeah, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I think I had a personal conversation with him on the phone. I don't remember it, um, but I do remember, you know, putting my arm around him and, and talking to him in Phoenix uh, after I got a chance to see him face to face and, and, and I could see, um, I could see his, his character and what he was feeling internally because of what happened after him seeing me. So I can only imagine what it was like not knowing or that night of, or the days after. So, um, you know, that's, that's one of the toughest things 
that we do as drivers is have to check our feelings because of what we do and the things that we are, are required of us to be competitive and to push everybody's envelope. Um, and, and, um, it's just the way it is. And the guys that get it, and I believe he does, the guys that get it have a lot of respect for that. And, and, and therefore I have more respect for him. Great. Thank you. Our next question is going to come from Jerry Jordan. Go ahead with your question, Jerry. Hey, Ryan, I still remember my first interview from your rookie year. So, that was, you know, that I was back there too. <laughs> you, you tweaked my interest on something a while ago when, with Jacob's question and then a little bit right there with, uh, with, that, with Zach. You said you looked for every angle, every piece of film that you could see of your wreck. How soon after that accident did you look for that? And how long did it take you to kind of digest everything uh, after going through it and, and to review what had happened? <clears throat> yeah, this is um, this a, you're going to give me a long answer. I'm going to give you a long answer here because I was more worried. The answer is I was more worried about all the other things I had going on with my life. Obviously, my kids weren't around me. Uh, I needed to get some answers from the doctors. I needed to understand what my short term and long term situation was going to be with any kind of injury. Right. Because at that point, you don't know. I mean, doctors are waiting and looking at you like, and they, you know, they walk in like with a with a magnoscope in front of both eyes trying to figure out whether well, is he okay or is he better? Is he the same or what to expect? And then, um, you know, as, as I, um, as I learned more about what had happened, um, you know, I didn't, I don't remember. And I couldn't tell you if it was in the hospital or at my parents' house because of the medicine that I was on, which is still the answer that I give and the knowledge that I have of, um, I can't answer my, the level of my injuries because if I don't, I don't, I don't know what the causes and the effects were of the medicine that I was on. And, uh, I just remember my dad telling me and showing me what happened. And I took me asking him to believe him why I was laying in a hospital bed. And, um, I studied it a little bit, but at that point I was more worried about, as I said, the other things that are more important to me in life than myself. Um, never been one to kind of look in the mirror. Um, I put a hat on to cover my hair or lack of, but that's about it. And um, the, the, the last part of your answer is um, not until, and, and this is what made me chuckle is because YouTube is an amazing tool that learns. It makes you learn about yourself that I didn't realize that somebody had created a YouTube video of every angle of my crash until probably a month or two, maybe three months ago, time flies when you're having fun. Right. And, off season but I, I i remember seeing it months after my crash that somebody had put together that video and i i mean a little literally laid in bed one morning as it popped up as a like we know you like these things so check this out well like well hell that's me so i looked at it and i watched it and it was just a different perspective right i mean it brought tears to my eyes it's like damn but then those are tears of respect and appreciation not tears of sadness because I was, I was here and I was able to watch it and know that just down the hallway, my kids were going to wake up shortly. Thank you, bud. Appreciate it. Thank you. We've had a, we've had a question emailed in from our friend Wolfgang Munzer in Germany. And uh, Wolfgang's question is, a lot of talk has uh, gone into the next generation car, the next gen car for 2022. But what work has been going into the current Rush Fenway car as you head into the 2021 season? A lot of work and we needed it. Um, there's no doubt about that. Our, our on-track performance last year was, was substandard. And um, we all know that. I mean, from my expectations personally, the team's expectations, uh, Jack Roush's expectations, um, you know, we, we needed a lot of work um, to be done. So it takes a lot of work to get a lot of work done, which seems very generic. But the reality is, is we had to figure out um, a lot of the things that we needed to get the bulk of our homework done. And we had a lot to play catch up with. And, and I feel like we've done a good job of doing that. Um, but the real answer doesn't come until they drop the checkered flag on let's just say the first three or four or five weekends of the season to know that we've made those improvements or the necessary improvements to be more competitive. I don't, I don't look for us to go out there and lead the most laps at Daytona or Homestead or the or the uh, road course for that matter, um, but.
but I want to be competitive and I want to show that we've made some huge improvements in the off season because I know you can't just write the ship um, and carry speed. If that makes any sense. So it, it, you got to slow down the ship to turn it. If you want to turn it as sharp as we needed to turn it. Um, and then we've got to build some speed. And, 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 and I feel like we've done that, but I have no proof yet. Okay. We'll go to our next question. That's from Eric Smith. Go ahead with the question, Eric. Yeah, Ryan, I just asked uh, Kurt this last time. Um, I'm just curious, talking to some of the IndyCar guys after they won the Indy 500, the years as they go past, the fire burns deeper. Like, they almost get jealous this, once they had that feeling that somebody else is winning and bottling up where they couldn't. Since you're winning 08, and especially as close as you were last year, leading on the final lap, do you does the fire burn for you deeper each year you come to Daytona since you're winning 08? No, I never look at it that way. Um uh, and I say that because, um, and I'm going to give you just a little piece of private information, but I'm pretty sure it's unanimous across the board. There's not a driver out there that doesn't have that burn or doesn't have that desire. And I say that because um, as much of a team sport as this is, even when your teammate wins, you're still more disappointed and or jealous that you didn't win. You can be happy that your teammate won but it still makes it that much more of a burn, I guess you could say, internally and externally, um, because you haven't. And that makes you want to fight that much harder. If you have the passion for the sport and the desire that it takes to be a winner, that will always be inside of you. And my point is no matter, no matter the situation or who wins or how close you were, that's always going to exist. I don't know that it exists more and I can't say that I feel like it more since 2008. Um, I feel to me it's the same no matter what. Awesome. Thanks, Ryan. I'm a fellow Hoosier too, so appreciate watching you race all these years. So thank you. Yeah. Our next question will come from Jason Beck. Go ahead with the question, Jason. Ryan, um, I'm from Speed Illustrated Magazine. And as you know, our a large portion of our audience is the grassroots racer and we're pretty laser focused on safety. And I was just wondering, was there anything that you were able to take away after after looking at the car now and after looking at the data that maybe would translate over to the grassroots racer to the short track guy um, to put into his car? I mean, obviously we, we can't have, you know, unlimited safety, our budget's much smaller, but is there, is there things that you learn in the accident that we could apply to our race cars to make them safer? Yeah, I guess the one thing that you make me think of when you ask a great question like that is, um, the simple things go a long way. And I, and I say it as a simple thing because um, one of the things that I felt like was compromised the most was my helmet. And if I had a picture of my helmet, you wouldn't believe that my head still is round um, or the shape that it's in, whatever whatever you want to call that shape. The reality is is um, make, make, make sure that the most expensive part in your race car is what, what contains the driver um, and makes the driver safe. Um, so it's not about spending the most money. It's about getting the best equipment and safest equipment when I say that. So don't cut corners is, is the real answer. Um, when it comes to a head and neck restraint, when it comes to gloves, when it comes to fire retardant materials, um, the quality of helmet, and, and, and that's, and that's a, a loaded answer in itself because of the quality of the helmet isn't just how much it weighs. It isn't just about how many tear offs you can put on it. It isn't about so many things, you know, how, how well it breathes, those types of things. The quality of the helmet is is all of those things. Um, and that and that changes depending on the situation that you're in, the tracks that you race at. Um, you know, roll bar padding and things like that are, are huge. Um, but I, I guess the, the, the reality is, is just to be cognizant of all the things. Um, as a short track racer, um, let me say it this way, I... I go back and I think about when you ask that, I go back and I think about um, an issue that they were having last year or that came to came to light with an exit of a racetrack at a dirt track. And I remember sending pictures to Tony Stewart who was working on it and just collectively putting our thoughts together. Um, and I never wanted any recognition for it, but the reality was, is we were all working on it together to figure out how to make that short track safer for the competitors and for the fans and, and everybody really for that matter. So it's not just a helmet. It's not just a safer barrier. It's everything that you can do as a person to, um, 
to collectively put it all together. I mean, it could be simply changing the angle of the lights or making sure that there's lights in the pit area so that when the cars come off the racetrack, they're not hitting fans. I mean, it's, it's so many things. Thank you so much, Ryan. I appreciate your answer. Yep. Thank you. Well, Ryan, thank you for taking the time to join us today and uh, good luck on the 14th in the Daytona 500. Take care.